And we are live. Welcome to Life Action Roleplay with Kai Norman and Ryan Omega. Joining us for tonight are our guests. Please introduce yourself, please. I'm going to start with Mike. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mike Graves. Um, I've known Kai here for a few years, and I play a whole lot of D&D. Thank you, Mike. Uh, is there anything else that they might know you for, specifically in the realm of D&D or whatever you have played? Uh, I do have a um, Twitch channel, Eldritch Sky Gaming. Uh, every Sunday night, I run a Rime of the Frostbaden campaign with some friends of mine. Nice. Nice setting. And we also have Spencer. Introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Spencer Winter. Um, I have been LARPing for 10 years now. I started and ran my own LARP for three or four years. And uh, I don't really have a presence on the internet. That's not really my jam, but I'm here. I've known Kai for a while. I play in his LARP. All right. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us. And uh, let's go around the table and ask, what is everyone drinking today? I'm going to start with Kai. Uh, I am being completely boring and just, you know, using... Regular water. I uh, I found those uh, little squirty things, the Mio's and things. Uh, apparently, I decided that wasn't enough sugar, so I got the Jelly Belly brand instead, which is way more powerful. Uh, There's a choices. Jelly Belly brand of Mio? Water flavor, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, not Mio specifically, but yeah, water additive flavor thing. It's very sugary, very powerful, and I, I basically use like a little tiny squirt and it gives it a little bit of flavor. I'm curious, but scared. I'll send you some. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you probably Mike, won't thank me when you get it. That, well, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Mike, what are you drinking today? Um, I'm having some 21st Amendment. Heller High Water or Heller High Mango because it is light and fruity, just like me. <laughs> Hot. Uh, wait, Perfect. 21st Amendment. Is that like a juice? Is that a beer? What is that? It is a beer. It, it is a beer. Beverage. Okay. All right. It's a beer type beverage. Spencer, what are you drinking today? I'm having a tea out of a kind of ridiculous looking rooster teapot. <laughs> Fantastic. You got to show that to us again. Tea out of kind of ridiculous looking uh, rooster teapot. It is part of my collection of terrible cursed roosters. You have a collection of these? Of terrible cursed roosters. It's very specific. Um, it, without fail, causes awkwardness in the line at the thrift store. Nothing but awkward and terrible roosters. Awesome. <laughs> and I am having a... Oh, goodness. Uh, the bottle just stuck to my play mat, so that was just awkward. Um, I'm having Gekakan sake because it's a sake kind of day today was a scenario where we had things set up and then they failed and then we had things set up and then they failed and then we had another thing is set up and they also failed and then we have these two handsome gentlemen that decided to join us and i'm like everything will now be fine and true. yeah Happy to help it's very true and shout outs uh does anybody have any shout outs that they want to give today so shout outs are generally to other organizations, to players, to channels, especially if there were good role play moments or people who just deserve more notice. Uh, I'm gonna start with Kai. Come back to me. Okay, <laughs> I will come back to you. Mike. I was typing to the chat, so I, I yeah. Yeah, no um, worries. I don't, I don't have much. Uh, I guess shout out to my homie Soren, who's a great artist and does great character art. Nice. And you can find them on Twitter at Schrodinger's King. Very cool. Spencer, any shout outs? Um, I'm going to shout out to India and Amanda who are currently in the chat. They're both uh, LARP friends of mine who are here to hassle me and threaten me about um, answering questions about babies instead of LARP, apparently. Why babies? Um, in my real life, I'm a developmental scientist and baby expert, so I know a lot about babies. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, Kai, do you have a shout out developed? Um, yeah, actually, my shout out is um, specifically to Sin uh, because she is not present with us because of such problems as uh, I think it's what internet out of outages and there's a fire going on somewhere, right? Yes. Yeah. Those are good reasons to not show up. Yes. So we love you, Sin. We hope that you and your family are safe and 
we will have you join us when you can. You'll at least hopefully join us for my uh, my boardroom game when that comes up, uh, which is related so to good. yeah, which is related to my shout out. Um, uh, my shout out is to every person uh, who has played in any of my games on Game Over Video Chat especially a lot of these independent games that have never been tried and a lot of the opportunities for new players to actually have their first time playing on live stream was on that. But now we have a couple of games that they have been so popular that those casts want to turn them into series. And so those, so we're working on that. So shout out to all of my players and uh, good times. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. I said good times, and you can also find all of those episodes on this channel in various times and places. Yes, you can find all of those games under Game Over uh, under Game Over Video Chat on the VOD on Twitch.tv slash Live Action Role Play. And uh, for today's topic, we're going to go with a topic that was suggested by Kyle Dong on Kai's page when he was asking for different topics and this was one that we all kind of keyed into because it was just a really interesting one the topic is how to create memorable characters whether that's a memorable pc or npc and i know that people people in their head want to be the hero and they want to have amazing stories but how do you create that and are there ways to seed that into being, or does that happen just by incident? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Our first question is going to be to the whole group. What is your favorite, most memorable character that you have played? And then I'm going to follow it with the second question is, what's the most favorite memorable character that someone else has played? I'm going to start with Mike. So it's a two-part question. Okay. Uh, my favorite character that I have played. And that can I, include I, include NPCs and stuff as well, because you do a lot of DMing work, don't I, you? I, I pr yeah, primarily DM. Um, but I've played I've I've played a lot of different characters. I think my favorite character concept um, that I only got to play a bit, and I would kind of like to return to him, is a character named Ronin, who is a literal samurai from actual feudal Japan. Um, I have I, I've got this tying thread in a lot of the games that I DM uh, this interdimensional bar called the always in that is pretty much a superposition of a bar and ex exists in all timelines and realities simultaneously. And sometimes you just happen to see it and be able to walk through the door. Uh, and his whole story was that, you know, he was a, a, a Ronin in feudal Japan and came across this door, walked through it into this bar filled with like orcs and mages and giant chickens and cage fights and weird stuff like that. Uh, and when he tried to leave again, it didn't take him back home. So he's literally just sort of reality hopping, trying to find his way back home. And every time he goes back through the doors, he hopes that it's the last time before he's, he's back in Japan. Awesome. Um, what about the uh, character that someone else has played? Um, that was probably in uh, my my friend who is also named Mike uh, that I played in a Descent into Avernus campaign with. Um, and his character and my character ended up becoming like best friends. Uh, and he was literally just this super old man of a wizard and he really, really played up the old man part. And he's had the voice and everything, and he was just adorable, and my character would have probably not died for him, but murdered literally anybody for him, uh, which is kind of what happened in the end, because he got corrupted by devils, and my character was like, nah, it's me and you, buddy. We're roommates. Uh, let's have Spencer answer those questions. So favorite character that you have played and favorite or favorite memorable character you have played, favorite memorable character someone else has played. Oh, definitely. Memorable and favorite are two very different things. Yes. Um, so memorable for me uh, is not going to be a LARP character. It was actually, I was invited by a friend up in Seattle to visit his D&D &D table for one time. It was an ongoing campaign. I was just hopping in for one session, then hopping out and vanishing. And so the character I made was a halfling woman named Sweetie. 
and she was a like knight in shining armor had like the the like silver pauldrons like went out of her way to she had this true and deep belief that there is a princess that she was going to rescue that like she was going to be the chosen one that she was a valiant knight what have you so this, this was who she wanted to be stats why she was a barbarian um her armor was like tinfoil she was a performance artist and was part of a performing troupe where she did this whole act of being this like great and incredible knight and the whole idea was that she's hmm. you know flawed from the start she plays herself up as this incredible paladin but really like just as kind of a halfling of anger issues who can't doesn't really know how to respond to other people around her um only played her for the one session it was a lot of fun it was a lot of really funny antics um and i still get messages about her this was like three or four years ago only there for one day i still get messages so that's why i'm pretty sure she's the most memorable um and then the most memorable i've seen what this one else do it was a new larper way back in alliance and he did a like number one capital offense like don't do this this you're gonna regret this larp oopsie and he made a super edgy assassin character who didn't speak. And I think everybody knows that one guy who's come to LARP of a brand new character who says, I'm going to play an edgy assassin who doesn't talk. Everybody warned him. Everyone said, like, it's fine. You can, like, back up off this you're not talking thing whenever you want. No one's going to, like, this guy stuck to it for two and a half years. Oh, my God. Dang. Didn't say a word at all. Two and a half years. Never said a single word in character. Finally, after two and a half years, he says something. It was the biggest moment that I've ever seen happen in that LARP. Just the long con for two and a half years. Incredible. Wow. Please tell me when he said something, it was like the funniest stuff you've ever heard. Oh, it actually contextually was extremely funny. It was very unfortunate. Excellent. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if you're going to be silent for two years, I really hope your opening line is a zinger. Right? Hi. Hi. Um, same question. Favorite memorable character you've played? Favorite memorable character someone else has played? Okay. Um, hmm. So I've been thinking about a couple of them, and honestly, I keep falling back on uh, the radio host that I uh, put together for uh, a big like Dystopia Rising prequel one-shot uh, that happened recently. And Honestly, they're more of an NPC than anything else. But it was really fun to uh, kind of plan out a lot of their identity. And a lot of their interactions were pre-recorded footage. So I wrote scripts. I had an idea of what certain things that were probably going to be happening at certain times. And then I did a lot of audio editing. And all of that process, I was able to, like with sound effects and um, uh, just a lot of fun audio editing i felt i was able to kind of tell a very different kind of story with the character than i really was expecting if i was actually like fully um like improvising them at the start so i realized that they aren't i mean they were created as a role play character and they did do some role play but the majority of their entire existence was kind of pre-recorded footage so it might not count but it was really interesting doing that on a lot of different levels as far as uh, memorable characters in uh, like uh, other other environments, other games, and so forth, hopefully this doesn't seem cheeky, but actually um, Spencer is the player of a certain wild character by the name of <laughs> by the name well, of Chooch. That is his uh, nickname. His full name is Choo Choo Man. <laughs> ah, thank you. Um, who is a post-apocalyptic? Uh, uh, you know what, Spencer? Do you want to do a, a brief description? I don't know if I can actually encapsulate how amazingly weird and incredible this character is. One of my favorite things to do is to create characters that 100% sound like jokey, stupid, mean characters on the surface until you meet them and realize they're 100% totally and completely serious. Um, <laughs> it's always fun. It never fails to uh, to um, create enjoyment. Choo Choo Man is a fanatical cultist oh my goodness how do you describe Chi Chi man um he, he is his faith is focused on breaking the rails of trains and intentionally derailing trains as a metaphor for releasing oneself from one's own personal like fears and things that would keep you down the 
reins of capitalism, the reins of the boss, the reins of, oh, I'm kind of anxious about this thing, all of those things. So the whole thing is a domestic terrorist cult mixed in with positive vibes, you do you boo, on top of trains. Mm. And so, they keep finding more trains. Folk punk terrorists, basically. <laughs> Honestly, essentially. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, being around uh, Chooch has been fascinating to me. Uh, not only do they tend to like in, uh, influence story in ways that we don't usually predict, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of players really enjoy interacting with the, that character, especially with all of the costume that you've built, because it looks like a gimmick, but it isn't. And that is a wonderful uh, like playoff of things. Uh, Ryan, do you have some to share? Yes. Favorite memorable character that I've played. Anyone who has seen any of this podcast knows, like, I always talk about the Archduke Sicario, but that's not my favorite memorable character. It's actually Marion Tendo from Dystopia Rising. Part of it is because when he was conceived, it was kind of like stemmed from a conversation that Kai and I had when I was... Um, Partly because I was so afraid of the genre because I didn't know this genre very well. The post-apocalypse and zombies are not my thing, uh, to be quite frank. They're not your but usual genre. It's not my usual genre. And uh, so I had to come up with something that I was familiar with. And I just had this silly idea of just playing Mario. And Kai said, well, you just want to be careful not to play him too literally because that's not the point. And then, then I thought, okay, what if I, you know, took what I knew of Mario and just broke him down into just a simple handyman that just bore a big pow hammer, and um, his aim was to help people and make a uh, and kind of like rebuild the world, but has everything just skewed off into Never Neverland because uh, he's been locked up in Barclay for forever, and, or which is the equivalent of Berkeley because that's the opposite of Stanford. Um, and my alma mater was UC Berkeley, so I, I take that with pride. Damn it. <laughs> but it was a fun character to just play, and I really got to do a lot of things with Marion that I had never been able to do um, with any LARP character, like an hour of sneaking around, trying to rescue people, literally running from place to place to place. I'm not a super athletic runner or cardio person. I hate cardio. I will run as Marion. I even got into romantic RP, which was not expected at all, but that was amazing. Ryan, Memorable character that someone else has played. Before you do that, could I yeah. read something that I absolutely adore about Marion? Sure. So Marion has taken as an element of depth, and I think this is really important for our our topic. Mm -hmm. uh, Mar Marion took a lot of the elements of the narrative of Super Mario and started trying to apply them into a more uh, like helpful or th philosophical way. It's another reason, uh, it's why I like Chooch, uh, Chuchu Man, and I do also love Marion. Uh, and Ryan made these like really interesting, like vaguely post-apocalyptic and Mario-inspired th uh, kind of uh, poems. Uh, Ryan, are you? Uh, I found it. Are you okay with me reading it out? Because I yes, because I don't remember what I wrote. So now I'm curious. Okay. Once there was a mushroom cloud. A dragon rose from sea. One brother fought his share of ghosts. The other fought in dreams. But then one day the dragon came and snatched the brother's peach. That held the treasured shining star beyond the brother's reach. The elder of the brothers took the brunt of dragon flame, and swallowed death, became a whole, we do not speak his name. To fight our long dead brothers, we must be bigger than we are, to touch the dreams of mushroom clouds, and reach the shining stars. And every time I say that, I get chills. Like, I, no kidding, have goosebumps right now. It's so good. That's great. Oh, mm. thank you. Thank you. I mean, a lot of, again, Credit to that one random conversation, just trying to figure out what to play, was in, again, thanks to Kai. That's the reason why Marion was created. Um, memorable characters that other people have played. I have a tie, um, and it's unfortunate it's a tie, but it's because both of these players are just 
so amazing. Um, one is a character in Twin Mask uh, named Shakes. Um, very memorable character for a player to be completely mute um, for three years of role play and not make it through um, saying out of character, this is what it means, doesn't explain that at all, does not use sign language, uh, is not literate. So everything has to be created. Luckily, the player, Jordan, is an actual mime, and Jordan has been uh, on this podcast before. But like seeing everything he's done and leaving such a legacy and just such a memorable character um, is amazing. And I always feel honored that I play his brother, you know? Um, the first time he spoke was not speaking. We were in the dream realm and he sang. And I wept for half an hour continuously because it was the first time my character Zakariel heard his brother Shakes speak. And it was a song. And it was just, ah. Uh, and then when I was crying, they were consoling me. Then everybody was crying. But like half of the room was just crying. And at some point, Shakes was actually crying while performing. It's like, we were just, oh, so good. The other person who I want to recognize, one of the most memorable characters I've seen is um, Vivka's uh, portrayal of the Malkavian Cyanide. She played a Malkavian. She had never LARPed before. This is her first LARP character. And she was scared. She told me, I was scared to, you know, if, you know, can I do this? I'm like, yes, Vipka, you can do this. You're a performer. I will write you a character that is within your, your wheelhouse. You'll be fine. So she played uh, Cyanide to the nth degree. Due to circumstances, became Prince in our game of Hollywood Forever. And everyone who's dealt with her has said, you know, the weird part is, beyond the crazy speech she's not that crazy and that uh is brilliant because she never at um at one point made her made her speech easier for people to understand or she and she kept being uh true to that uh difficulty of speech because that's what her character would do and i've always admired vivka's stick to to um to difficult role play and makes it look easy that is not an easy thing to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, one of the things that, uh, with both of the characters, Shakes and um, Cyanide, they had their own language that certain other players started getting really good at interpreting. And mm -hmm. other characters and players were not getting it, either because they didn't have the time uh, or the interest to learn it, um, or, you know, they're just busy in things. But, um, like... I don't know how to speak shakes like Jordan's character. And every time he's kind of like making whistles and like hand gesturing and like pantomiming things, I'm like, I, does anyone speak shakes here, please? And the same thing with cyanide, like was dropping these really profound statements hidden within the weird babble that the character was using. And it would actually cause like people around to kind of stop and wait, go like, wait, is she saying this thing here? And everyone's like, oh, that's a really good point. But they just got it from someone that's loony uh, and not talking coherently. Uh, so yeah, like wild, wild stuff. Um, language barrier and it, experimenting with language barrier is a really, really memorable trait that uh, can be very useful if you do well with it. Well, so first of all, we have a very rain, big range of memorable character so now the question is how do you make one because it almost sounds like uh there must be a gimmick to every single character type and in some way it almost sounds like there is but i feel like there's more um to that go ahead spencer i yeah, have a lot of opinions here um first of all i think that to make a memorable character, the very first thing you have to do is set your own expectations aside. I think that very often when people come into making a LARP character, but presumably a tabletop character too, the first thing they think of is what do I think is cool? And almost always the thing that I find makes actually truly memorable characters, whether or not this is actually what you care about is up to you, I suppose. But usually the, the interactions that I remember most are people who are willing to play with me in my space. And so when I try to make a character that is memorable, I make a character whose focus is other people and their stories. So for example, for Choo Choo Man, he has like no plot line to him. 
um, no like thing for him. There's nothing there. Everything that he does, everything about him is about adding to other people's stories. And in my experience is if you want to be memorable, if that's specifically what you're going for, that is the easiest way to do it is just play in other people's spaces with them and they will remember you. Very valid. <clears throat> if you're in someone's uh, play space like, uh, and they have a good interaction with you, it's a good time. Or a bad interaction, which sometimes can still be a good interaction, depending. Uh, the important thing is the player is having fun. Uh, even if the character is not having fun, as long as you are enjoying the experience, that's the important part. And obviously, if you are not enjoying yourself, you might want to consider ways of uh, either disengaging uh, or changing the role play so you can have fun. Yeah, there's there's actually... Um, <clears throat> I've got a friend, one of my players, uh, really cool guy, Morgan. Shout out to you. Um, and he does a lot of ARG type stuff. Um, but he was reading this... Altered reality, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, alternate reality games. Uh, he's really into him, just has the brain for that stuff. Uh, but he was reading this this handbook. It's a huge handbook for some Norwegian LARP group. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it has this concept in it that I absolutely adore, that I fell in love with once I read it. It's like it's one of those things that as a DM and as a player, I've always kind of known, uh, but just to hear it put into words so simply the the rule is simply play to lose yes yes like it it you know that doesn't mean try to die every chance you get but stop trying to win and succeed at everything a good story and a good character has ups and downs and if your character doesn't have any downs then there's you know there, there, there's no tension it's like playing doom with god mode on also in a yeah. game where there is inherent risk, um, creating a character that has no risk and has no detriments, when those detriments come up, it is particularly painful um, and usually draws people um, into painful circumstances they wouldn't necessarily want to be in. If I am convinced that my character is 100% a total cool badass 100% of the time, and then I flub a role, or I don't beat Kai as an NPC, or fill in the thing here that is going to turn from a fun interaction into a game breaking. Now I feel bad situation. Do you think creating characters that are meant to validate the player is a, almost like a dangerous move in that regard where you're making a character that's cool because you want to feel that way. But when faced with something that doesn't make you feel cool, uh, the bleed just becomes very, very big because uh, it was based on the idea of, you kind of wanted to play something cool. I I think that that definitely happens uh, for people who can't separate themselves from their characters in in that way. Like it's totally fine to live vicariously through your character. In my opinion, it's it's a power fantasy. It's you're meant to feel like a total badass sometimes. You're meant to ride that dragon and chop its head off midair and do the superhero landing when you hit the ground. You know. But um, I think that there's definitely that line where if you cannot separate your character's failures from your own or simply accept the fact that letting your character fail sometimes is sometimes the most interesting thing that you can do. I think, I think that that bleed definitely happens. I, I've seen it in plenty of my games uh, with players who get too attached to their character and don't like seeing them fail. I feel like uh, almost with uh, certain games where you have uh, like a little bit more freedom on things, like, for example, it works in D&D &D if the party definitely has the re resources uh, to resurrect everyone if there's like a partial party wipe. Um, like that gives you that little bit of safety buffer where, um, you know, a failure uh, that results in death or something um, isn't as tragic. Uh, or it's you know recoverable from. No one likes to permanently lose their character unless they really give that character a good send off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just dying in the street because someone wanted uh, some change is not a good ending for a character most of the time. I think there's like there's an easier you know using the big tough fighter badass is an easy example to use, but you see it in subtler ways too. I've encountered players who are very convinced that, especially this is especially for LARP where you don't have just roles to determine things, but who are very convinced that they want to play say a master manipulator or a ultra charismatic character or something like that. And just, they put so much power into wanting to do that, but they can't quite pull it off. And it creates 
this like horrible cycle of turmoil. And for me as a player, when I meet somebody who clearly has this idea of their character that's not quite coming through, I'll go out of my way to like play in their space and play the way that they clearly want their character to be perceived if I can. But that doesn't mean that it's still not going to come up and still not going to be a problem. The other thing I think that just is, is important for creating a memorable character in general, at the start, all of our stories were people who had gimmicks, like we said, but those are also the stories that are easy to tell and they're easy to sound by up. Most of the characters that I think of where I like go, oh, that character, wow, are people that are like very firmly grounded in a base of reality where they feel like a real person and they have a real context and a real existence. And you can't really have that when you're a one note, you know, power fantasy of some sort or another. There isn't a realness there. There's a, I want to be this mismatch of characters I've seen and I want all the good parts. That is super, super true. And I think it actually leans into something I, uh, I'd love to talk about, uh, especially over this topic, um, is the difference between an archetype and a stereotype. Because those two things, a lot of people confuse. And the less you confuse them, the better. A player should always try to create an archetype rather than a stereotype. But before I, I'd like to hop into some of the, the, the interesting things I know around that, do, do, either of, uh, do any of you three have any comments about like archetypes, stereotypes, that type of stuff? Yeah, I think that there is, j j just like there's value in using gimmicks to create a character that can then be fleshed out further and become a really good character, uh, stereotypes can also be utilized in a similar fashion where you can create a character based on a stereotype with the intention of subverting the stereotype in some way, or at least, you know, being self-aware of the stereotype and playing it up. You know, mm -hmm. I think, I think a really good example of archetype versus stereotype is Conan the Barbarian. Conan the Barbarian is the archetypal barbarian. When you think barbarian, I think most people will picture Arnold Schwarzenegger Conan. And then I think the stereotype that is in that same vein is the really, really dumb, but really, really strong barbarian. Um, Who runs around half naked, grunts a lot. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, just wants to kill everything. When it's like, if you look at, Barbar or at, at Conan, who is the archetype, Conan was actually quite intelligent. He was a master tactician and knew what he wasn't capable of and had allies uh, who he would put in the forefront to do the things that he wasn't able to do. Whereas most big, dumb, smashy barbarians are just going to be like, I'm going to hit it until this problem goes away. It's true. Uh, Spencer, do you have any comments on that? The other problem, especially with stereotypes specifically, is it has to be really careful. If you want to take a stereotype and you want to lean into it, you want to do something with it, you have to be careful that it's your stereotype to take. I ran into, this almost never happens, I finally encountered a tabletop game where somebody was playing a trans character. This almost never happens. People play characters that are different genders from themselves. Mm -hmm. People almost never play trans characters. Mm -hmm. And they did a really respectful job of it. I want to start off by that. But every once in a while, there'd just be something that'll come up where I'd go. And it would just like sort of smack me in the face. And I think that's the kind of thing that we have to be really, really careful about when we're trying to create thoughtful, careful characters is that no matter what, we, it's, we can pull from stereotypes that we have personal experience with and that we have access to, but it's harder to pull from stereotypes that we aren't a part of. Mm -hmm. And it's harder to do that well. Um, I think we see that a lot, this a lot, especially around like uh, um, East Asian stereotypes and LARP is a huge thing that happens all the time. And I don't think people come in intentionally meaning to be, uh, you know, stereotypical or cruel or mean. I think they intend to come in being cool. There's a lot but, of things that are really exciting and aesthetically appealing about a lot of that stuff. And because it isn't really our culture, it looks different and you feel like you're being a badass because you've got this individuality that others don't have necessarily absolutely and it's so hard to identify and it's so hard to recognize personally because if you don't know then you don't know and that's just the way that it is mm -hmm. um for me uh being asian myself the way i kind of treat it is that um i do get a lot of questions about um how okay is it to play someone who is an out character basically out as in like uh like not my not my own experience um for me uh it's a matter of it's a matter of like intent 
And if you don't get everything 100%, that's totally okay. As long as you do like a little bit of research into your character, then for me, it's fine because what you, what, what's ultimately important is that, that these characters are kind of rooted in some kind of realness rather than a set of traits. Because when you get someone like, and this is an example that I always talk about. I always talk about the Moana example. Um, the what? The Moana example, you know, like the, char- the, the character Moana um, oh. from, from Disney. And um, the reason why I have no, no problem with anyone cosplaying Moana is because we all know that Moana is a character with a, with a story. Same thing with Black Panther. You're pl- a, an aspiring character with a story who has depth who has struggles and that kind of heroism is, you know, to be respected. But when you start cosplaying as someone who is Mexican and Mexican is defined as, you know, the sombrero with the beans and like, and the cucaracha, it's like, now you're taking a bunch of stereotypes and putting them into a person. And that is not okay because you start getting into all of these things that are not rooted in like a real experience. You're just taking images on what you think is cool or what you think is that um, ethnicity and making that into a character and that's not a character that is a stereotype when you're rooting it in real characters when you're reading it in stories when you're rooting it in experiences it does make playing another character that much richer because you are rooting it something um i saw one larper who was um who was white and he was playing hawaiian and when I was role playing with him, I was really impressed with his accent, his mannerisms. And he said, it's because I listened to a podcast for several weeks on how to speak um, pidgin English. And I'm like, oh, my God, like the way he conducted his mannerisms was just impressive. Just again, if you do your research and you you give your character a heart is another thing. Make sure that they they exist and are in existence onto themselves and not just a set of traits. And that becomes a, that becomes a really interesting character if you're going to play someone that is not your own experiences. And know that you will mis- make mistakes on occasion. And then you learn. You learn and you adjust. That's what you do. You just you adjust right away. But if you also have concerns, talk to someone in that experience and they can advise you. That's really good. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, I, I think I think like what it comes down to is the the respect for the culture that that you are pulling from, you know, uh, you know, stereotyping the culture, bad appreciating the culture, good, basically. <clears throat> one of one of my favorite descriptions of uh, the difference between uh, archetypes and stereotypes um, is that a stereotype is an oversimplified representation of a character. They're very flat, they're very two-dimensional, uh, they don't have depth. Um, and whenever you're making a character uh, that is gonna be something that you play, something that you want to enjoy, that you want to breathe, it needs to be more than you know a piece of paper. An archetype, on the other hand, is a prototype of a character. It is the base on which a character can be built. Uh, so, a couple of very clear, obvious examples of archetypes are, for example, the roles in a movie. Uh, you have the super, uh, you know, you have the hero archetype, you have the villain archetype, uh, you have the 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 wise man archetype, or so forth. Uh, you know, the mentor, and so D and D classes are often archetypes, and then you do have a stereotype attached to it, but it can be a more pure kind of like this is a this is a person who does this. This is their job description. And then you build up from it from there. Uh, a stereotype or an archetype on its own is not enough. Um, I think you're on a good start with an archetype. And a lot of people do settle on an archetype before they start anything, even if they don't realize it. Um, but uh, yeah, stereotypes are usually best avoided. Yeah. I think there are times when people... Um, are making these characters with the best of intentions and don't realize that they've made a stereotype. And I think maybe the easiest way to solve that um, is using Kai's example of, are you making, are you making a wizard? Or are you making a gay person? <laughs> That's the best way to describe it. If your construct is I'm making a gay, 
like that <laughs> that's going to be a stereotype a you know guy. i'm making an identity that's going to be a stereotype if your if your plan is i am making an occupation i am making a type of personality then you can put a person's identity on top of that and then give that more depth but don't construct an identity that never pans out well yeah no even like, if you wanted to say i want to represent these people that's great represent that as a scientist that would be amazing represent as an archaeologist bomb represent as these stereotypes that you've seen in rupaul's drag race no yeah no please don't please don't um i really think that cool is the trap i really think that that's is that is the base where people get stuck so often because i think we look at cool and we start making a pinterest board of what is cool instead of making a character mm -hmm. and i really think that that's where a lot of stereotypes lie is because we start going okay well this part is cool but not that part over there and then you wind up with this flat thing of all the things that look cool and then there's nothing else without any of the substance old flash nice substance so right on so right on should we continue to kind of discuss some uh like different directions and things or i have i have an idea but i think it might take up like kind of a lion's share of the time that we have left what i'm thinking is like we group pick like an archetype uh and then uh start talking about like what would be bad stereotypes and then try to lead into maybe uh some good ways of building up the character like we basically group uh consensus to make a character briefly um otherwise we can keep talking about a variety of topics on this because i think there's a ton more information we can share um i'm down for either i like i like that idea because we've never done it um, on this game. so this will be yeah. cool yeah okay. let's do it okay um so i'm gonna list some of the the most well-known uh archetypes uh you've got the hero the jester uh, the Explorer, and a lot of these are kind of like uh, script writing archetypes that are used in uh, uh, a certain kind of philosophy of writing known as uh, uh, Jungism. Uh, uh, the Ruler, the Outlaw, uh, the Enchantress, the Innocent, the Caregiver, the Magician, the Companion, the Actress, and the Sage. Do any of those sound fun? I think... I feel like the outlaw would be fun to explore. The outlaw is fun because I think there's a lot of opportunities for uh, pitfalls there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like that. Agreed. All right, so what are what are some stereotypes that we probably want to avoid as the outlaw? Probably bandanas that cover the face, maybe? Or is that... Mm... I feel like um, it's. I mean, less... I feel like that's a practical one. Yeah, that's, that's okay, definitely that's, a practical yeah. one. I feel like the like the the problem with outlaw specifically is it leans itself into a lot of like lone wolf. I don't work well with others. You know, I'm a lone wolf. I'm a lone wolf. Um, I got problems. nobody but me. My parents are dead. I'm on yeah. my own. It's just me in the road. Like yeah, I feel like that's really that's, where it leans itself into. You that's just described Batman. Fault. <laughs> Everybody, but is Batman, Batman <laughs> can work with others. <laughs> Batman knows where he lacks and is mm -hmm. is able to accept help. He's part of the Justice League, my man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's a huge pitfall of outlaw characters, and pretty much every rogue or every edgy edge lord rogue character in D, D falls into that trap of i'm a lone wolf i'm only here because i gotta be and it's like well no then actually why are you here you know it it's not fun for anybody else and it's not fun for you you're just this wall uh that role playing bounces right off of and that happens constantly on larp too um i think less so now than maybe five or six years ago i think people have kind of learned their lesson but even still like you know, you come in, you're like, I don't talk to anybody. I'm mean to everybody. If you look at me, I'll kick your ass. Hey, why did nobody role play with me all weekend? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the other problem with outlaws, um, and it goes, this, and it's the same for writing the stereotype of an evil character, is we take all of the worst traits. Like, oh, they come in and they have a gun and they shoot anybody on site that disagrees with them. And they come in and pillage and they do horrible things to the gender that they prefer and they're just a set of bad actions without bad any motivations and it's like there's no reason for them to be that much of an asshole uh th they would be more interesting if they did have a motivation it's like i'm doing this because uh 
um, because our town has no money and I am robbing them. It's like, okay, that's at least an interesting motivation, but every bad villain has just, you know, just does horrible things to get that reaction out of you, but there's nothing behind it. And that's what I hate about poorly written out laws. I think think there's also, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I think there's two things that were mentioned that I think are really cool. Um, One was something that Spencer mentioned. um, Damn, my memory has failed me again. Both of them were really good points. Um, One was something that you mentioned, uh, Spencer, that was uh, something, dead parents. Dead parents happen all the time. It is gone to the point of stereotype and cliche. Um, There have definitely been games that I've seen someone just kind of like, raise their voice and uh in the middle of a tavern with a whole bunch of characters and yell who has uh you know like who's lost all of their parents kind of thing it's like see everyone everybody yeah (laughs) um it is a very common pitfall trap and it's probably best avoided Mm -hmm. uh honestly if you start saying that you had a nice childhood you're probably going to surprise some people uh, but defining people as characters making important characters in your backstory to kind of like either lead you astray or guide you um, is a really good way of starting your, your kind of backstory element, as it were. Uh, I don't remember the other point, but I'm sure I will remember it in a minute. When I'm writing a backstory, I try to kill as few people as possible. Um, at worst, I leave it ambiguous what's happened to them. Mm. Um, and then I also try to leave as many open questions as I possibly can. And I try to never make it a finished story. It can never, because if you complete, like, it's a full arc, well, then now what are you doing? That's solid. I like that. Spencer, can we step into, like, an example on, uh, like, your one of your characters, for example? Sure thing. Uh, I so there you was... had an example. <laughs> I do. I do. If you're playing in a game that has resurrections, then death can mean things and it can instigate change uh, so long as, you know, that's kind of how the system is going. But whatever you do, successes or failures should shape your character's perspective of stuff. Um, I remember that I was uh, in a scene that was kind of inside Spencer's character's head um, and it was kind of reliving some of the, the bad experiences that their character had as a child. And... I don't know how much of that was pre-established, if any. Like, did you, before I started asking kind of like leading questions and like almost forced you into these decisions of like yes or no, so like no but and yes and, um, did you have a defined like childhood for uh, for that character? Um, so the character we're talking about is Misha and that was, so in DR, you're required to have a backstory pre-written for um, limited characters, which I was. I did not have a backstory pre-written. I had a vague concept of what I was doing. Originally, I was going to come in of a group of other people and they all ditched me like the day before game. So the okay. entire concept I had was based on the idea that I was going to be coming into this group who then weren't there. And I had to completely redo the character just like out of nowhere. What I've tried to do with that character um, Everything that we did in that scene, that was all off the top of the dome, that was all kind of like figured out with Kai. And then what I leaned into was already the base concept that I had was um, I grew up real life in the town that was the murder capital of the United States until 2008. And a lot of my friends from there wound up being trapped in cycles of gang violence, wound up, you know, having horrible things happen to them. But one of the interesting things about living in that experience is it's very mundane it stops being something shocking. It stops being something horrifying. It stops being something that you can like lie on the floor and be traumatized about because it's just so normal. And so when I created Misha, what I really wanted to do is lean into that of this is a person who has grown up in a poor neighborhood, has had these bad things happen to him, but it's not a like, this is my tragic dramatic backstory. It's a, this is how life is where I'm from. Yeah, it's uh, like the survival of it has not become the entire crux of the character. It's more just like your character is a survivor. And there's the archetype, like your character is a survivor and continues to survive no matter what happens. Um, But yeah, like when we were establishing some of that backstory, uh, I was asking pointed questions of... uh, And I I would phrase them more as statements uh, sometimes, which allowed uh, Spencer to kind of argue with me or correct me and things. And that was all kind of... The, the idea that he could do that was pre-negotiated, uh, and it was very much what I was hoping for. But when someone starts asking you about your character's backstory and forces you into a situation where you have to answer, you'll be surprised what you can improvise sometimes. And sometimes you'll make a bad decision. 
Um, other times, not so much. But, you know, like if I'm asking Spencer's character, like, uh, you know, uh, how was your childhood or like, uh, were you bullied or things like that? It starts becoming a lot of resource that you can emotionally pull from and you can imagine. And the more you can do that for your character, the better. So giving that depth behind the scenes. Um, the more solid your character concept and baseline idea is, I feel the more easy it is to pull those pieces out of a hat. Like, obviously, I don't have a clear concept for every single little piece of everything. But because I have a very strong baseline of this is where he's from, this is who he is, this is how he is, whenever a weird example or a weird situation comes up, I can pull something out of there. Yeah, absolutely. Like the the that strong baseline for your character's backstory and and at least who they are as a person, like that core identity, uh, can inform so much uh, because you 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 can't think of everything. Uh, it's the same as world building when you're running a game uh, in your own homebrew world. You could spend years and years working on it and never think of everything. It's best to just get that baseline there and then let other people run around and play in that playground because you will learn as much as they do. Uh, and the same goes for your characters. You don't have to have a detailed timeline of their entire life, but if you have those major experiences and where they come from and whatnot, you know, when someone asks a question, you'll have a much better chance of coming up with whatever the answer is. The nice part about having having an outline of your past rather than full, fully formed structure is that uh, if you have been playing in the LARP or in the role-playing game, you now have opportunities for other people to come in and go, hey, I was this in your past. And it's like, yeah, there's room for it. Come on in. Or you might encounter, uh, just as Kai said, through the grave mine scenes, like things that uh, you've only touched upon become fully fleshed it becomes more interesting because it is a discovery within your backstory. Um, but both sides of whether discovering in your backstory or inviting other people to play in your backstory is just a wonderful, unique uh, thing that you can get in your stories if you leave those outlines and gaps open. Once you've cemented everything, you can only go forward and there's no time to reflect. Very, very much like Mike, uh, the piece of advice that you said about like, basically boils down to like, it's okay not to have everything in the backstory established. Like, that's a, that's a very important thing. And being willing to embrace the opportunity of things coming up. Uh, like, it's a good thing. Um, if you're LARPing, and you know a few people who already are LARPing in that game, or if you are playing in a D&D game, and you know your DM or you know your players, try to talk to your uh, the other people playing or involved in the game with the idea of establishing something called character ties. Uh, it is by far and large the quickest way that you can start giving some depth to your character. Um, making up some stories of things that you and this other person have gotten up to, uh, be them good or bad, you can have nemesis, you can have villains, uh, or you can have allies and, you know, heroic friends, or just some guy that you went to the pub with, you know, several times. Uh, making stories and, like, having some idea of what you've done with someone, again, helps kind of flesh out and build everything. Um, I love situations where you can world build either within your character or outside your character when you're creating something more on a, like, a, a game running experience where you know enough kind of loose um like archetypal uh elements of the character be it a nation because a nation can be kind of like a character uh or an individual person but these groups or singulars will start doing things that seem logical to you like uh you can predict what they're gonna do it makes sense in your head that oh if x happens then they're gonna respond with y and the more situations where you find you've got those kind of like archetypal uh, facts established in your character, the more you'll find that your character sort of plays themselves or writes themselves. And I personally always chase after that whenever possible. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's an amazing thing when you can get a hold of it. And if you start finding it, I suggest grabbing a hold of it. But um, yeah. Yeah, that's like, that's like the goal. 
uh, when building a character is being able to role play them in such a way that, uh, you know, you can come to a decision for your character and make a decision as your character that you yourself would not make. You know, a lot of people tend to play someone who aligns with their own moral views and worldview and whatnot. But I think if you want to make a really interesting character and it kind of ties back into that play to lose mindset, um, your character is going to make some bad decisions. Your character is going to do something selfish sometimes that might hurt other people or negatively affect uh, other players. And, you know, don't take that too far. Don't just become the bad guy and set off the nuke and kill everybody. But, Mm -hmm. but give your character that room to, to, do something that you yourself would not be comfortable doing within reason, of course. Uh, because I think that that's the sort of thing that can inspire really, really great inter-character role play and uh, have effects on the story going forward. Like you made this bad decision and you let the bad guy go because they're a childhood friend of yours and you hadn't realized that before and you couldn't bring yourself to kill them or capture them. Uh, and now you created a whole lot more problems for the world because the bad guy is still out there and it's your fault. And do you tell your party? Do they know? You know, do, do you keep that secret? How long can you keep that secret? What happens when people find out months down the line? Yeah, I feel like you're a character having a sense of responsibility for something that has happened in the past uh, and that being kind of a shaping point, like depending on how they act with that shaping point, I think that can add a huge amount of depth to a character and a per- sense of purpose. Um, working with uh, event runners and your, or your dungeon master or other, uh, other players to have these like potential like distant goals that you can try and aspire for. Um, or maybe you're not trying to aspire. Maybe you're not trying to fix your problem. Maybe you're trying to run away from your problem because you fucked it up the first time and you don't want to try it again. That is a very human response, by the way. You Mm -hmm. don't have to be a hero. Um, But you should always consider what your actions are doing to make sure that you're capable of... that everyone present is capable of having a good time. I realize that we weren't really uh, focusing too heavily on our, like sample outlaw kind of character um like we've just got a lot of interesting kind of factoids and things i'm not terribly upset about that but i think it might be kind of fun in the future to do if we plan it out a little bit more uh or like you know dedicate time to it i think that might be kind of fun to bring everyone back and try and make some dumb fun character or you know deep and interesting I mean, the nature of this podcast is that uh, conversation will go organically where it goes. So even if we started off with uh, trying to figure out uh, bad and good versions of an outlaw, the fact Mm -hmm. that we had richer discussion that came as a result of it is what was meant to end up on the podcast. Fair. One of our one of our uh, watchers, uh, Game and Right, uh, said also having those base situations with another character gives that baseline you were talking about earlier for improving as character uh, as the character, except for with a uh, a scene with another person. So we are we are getting over. Well, we're getting up to our time point. Yes. Um, uh, our guests have very graciously given us an hour of their time, if mm-hmm. not a little more. We'll take it from you like Worth vampires. <laughs> <laughs> but there is one thing that I would like to get from this roundtable. And what's one piece of advice that you would give to someone to for the topic, how to make a memorable uh, character? And I'm going to start off with Spencer. I'd say the very first thing is um, oftentimes you come to a table of an idea kind of already present in your head putting it aside and really embracing and looking into and swimming in the lore and the genre of the world that you're going into. Because you can find a lot of opportunities to create a character that lives and exists and is real within that world because that realness is what brings that memorability. Ooh, I like that. Mm, nice. Yeah, I, I'm, I would just kind of echo that. And that's, you know, whether, whether you're going to start with just an archetype, whether you're going to start with a gimmick or a stereotype for a character, um, make them real. Like it's, 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 it's okay for a character to be a stereotype. If they are a real character, if they feel like a real person who lives in this world that, that we're all sharing together, 
a lot of good can come from that. My piece yeah. of advice would be to pick a niche. Like that's slightly different from a gimmick. What I mean by that is in a game that I've played before, Super LARP, uh, there were heroes, uh, superheroes, and there were super villains. For whatever reason, that neither of those appealed to me, so I decided that I would be the male Lois Lane. And I actually took that opportunity to interview both of them um, and talk to the public with all of my followers. So how are you threatening the town? And then get the recording. And then, so how are you planning to save the town? And then um, over time, I ended up playing them against each other by accident. And I realized, oh, oh, I can play them against each other. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, and I considered that a niche. A gimmick is, um, I always juggle with these balls. Maybe that's not the best example of a gimmick, but that it's, it's sticking to like one trick that you're hoping to impress everybody by. Um, sometimes a gimmick that we're not aware of is sometimes uh, we spent $600 on armor and we have to wear it because we spent $600. We yep. must make a costume ba or character based on that when the role play or the LARP may not be well suited to you wearing armor. <laughs> so I understand the idea that some people want to make characters from a strong costume choice. But um, it ends up being a gimmick if your character is flat. Yeah. Like, uh, absolutely, in Twin Mask, my, my character's gimmick is his giant hat. Like, he's got a witch hunter hat. The character isn't a witch hunter. In fact, he's more a vampire hunter, so I lean more into the Von Helsing style. But that is a gimmick. Uh, Sicario's... Um, uh, goblet is a gimmick. Uh, Misha, I would say either Misha's mask or giant radioactive door shield is a good example of mm -hmm. a gimmick. Um, Mike, I haven't met any of your characters, and I feel that that is unacceptable, and in the future we should game together. We absolutely have to game together. We, we've never had the opportunity. With the, the embracing of the, the world around you, I, I think that is by far and large the best piece of advice that you can ever give someone that is stepping into a new game. Um, embrace the lore, embrace the world, and learn about it. Because not only will your character seem more realistic because you know about the world, but also chances are you're going to find things that inspire you. You go, oh, that's really cool. Oh, I hate those guys. I want to be against them. They're going to be my enemies. Um, or I love those guys. I'm going to side with them. Uh, like there's, there's so much potential when you jump into the lore side of things. Um, very, very, very good stuff. Um, I think another step with that is also try to balance your uh, perceptions of what you as a person are capable of and what your character is capable of. And yes, yeah, sometimes if you're playing a more physical game, you do have to consider what your physical body is able with. Or if you are cripplingly anxious talking to crowds, work into it, ease into it. You can't just jump into the middle of it and expect to do well because you're playing pretend. Um, that takes an astounding uh, amount of confidence and uh, like acting. And if you're capable of it, go for it. But uh, do not, uh, like, don't set yourself up to, uh, to fail in situations. Like, um, you can always turn things up, you can turn things down slowly, but if you set yourself on a certain level and you can't hit that level normally, then you are going to probably not enjoy yourself as much as you could. Um, I would add to that, that, um, don't be afraid of failure. Mm. because it gives you an opportunity to succeed later. I still remember this one moment where um, someone who played um, Lady Amarantha in, um, in Twin Mask, and she wrote this beautiful um, oath to solace when we became a nation. But I also know that the player was deathly afraid of speaking in public. And I asked her to please like say the oath. The way that I got her to do it is, first of all, I said that what you wrote was so important. It was important for everyone to hear your words because your words will reach everyone. And you can hold my hand. I will hold your hand as she speaks. And at first, it was a little nervous. But over time, um, she was not fully confident, but she was able to read and breathe and perform until everybody was standing up and saying the oath with her 
And I was very, very touched that that moment could happen. And this is not a moment, again, I, this doesn't mean push a person past their limits, but when possible, you can lend support and lift them to the role play that they can do. That is really eloquently put. Like that that's much more what I intended. And thank you for yeah, like I can see how some of what I was saying was not exactly on target with that. Um real quick, what I was trying to lead up to was personal knowledge. Um if you are a character that is stepping into a medieval world, try to consider what your character might know in a medieval world. Um if your character is a peasant, um being a peasant that uh, rebels against the nobility is very cliche. Everyone does it. Even if you think you're being edgy and a badass about it, it's one of the many pitfalls. It's not a bad thing to do and you can do it. But if you are going to do that, then you should probably look into what's going on and actually find things that you're unhappy with. Uh, I have definitely, by playing, I play on a lot of nobles. I've had people angry at nobles, but when I challenge them and say, what have we done to you? They didn't think that far, and mm -hmm. they were just having blind hate, which is not enough. Uh, having good justification for something that is important to your character is a really good step. And realizing the difference between the things that you might do in modern society and what your character might understand or know in that universe, be it post-apocalyptic, be it fantasy, be it something entirely different, um, considering like that knowledge connection, I think will always add that level of uh, extra depth to your character. Um, because so many people, I feel like I encounter more people than don't who adopt kind of a mindset in their head when they're playing LARPs and playing D&D where they approach it with modern ethics and ideals and morals and things like that. And there are places for it. I'm not saying that uh, wherever you are gaming is not the place for it, uh, but intentionally having some of that kind of like lack of knowledge can actually give you more to work with, um, especially if you're in an environment that is naturally superstitious. Not knowing something means that your character can be nervous and scared about it, and you can improvise coming up with stories about why you don't want to do this thing. Um, even if your friends do talk you into it, uh, having like, you know, the world outside that people don't know is scary and acting like you don't know everything can actually be a really fun out of the box experience that can help enhance your role play. Mike, where can people find you on the internet? Plug your pluggables. Uh, yeah, they, your pluggables. They can find me uh, on my Twitch channel, Eldritch Sky Gaming. Uh, my Twitter is also Eldritch Sky Gaming. I believe the actual at tag is Sky Eldritch. Because that's just what Twitter did, I guess. Um, and also on Facebook at Eldritch Sky Gaming. Uh, when's your next episode? Uh, our next episode will be this Sunday night, 5 p.m. Okay. to 9 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. There we go. Cool. I hope some people check it out. I hope so, too. The cast of characters is silly. Our dearest Spencer Winter Ratlord. <laughs> Do you have pluggables? Um, uh, I guess I suppose I do. I have a Facebook page at Splashproof Masks. Um, I make custom LARP prosthetics and LARP masks that are specifically engineered and designed to be comfortable in a LARP situation while they totally don't look like they are. Can agree and attest with this. Uh, Spencer makes a lot of masks that are like for tumbling and combat and stuff like that. And they're, they're all very good. My, uh, uh, at my, my personal game, I've got some of Spencer's monster masks and they are very good quality. Uh, and very carefully put together. So, Is it my turn now? It is your turn. Uh, you can find me on some of the places. I guess you can find me on Twitch, though I have not actually been uh, streaming anything recently. But you can find me on Twitch, uh, Twitter, and uh, Instagram under Yo Kai Props. Uh, you can either see that as like, Yo Kai Props, or more like the, the Japanese demon monster face with props. Uh, I don't mind whichever. Uh, but yeah, so puns and those types of things. Um, if you like art, you can check out the Instagram. Otherwise, I ramble and rant on Twitter. You are forewarned. 
And I'm Ryan Omega. You can find me here on this channel. On Tuesdays, I run a series called Game Over Video Chat. The next Tuesday, the 8th, at 8 p.m. Pacific time, we are playing a game which is a variation of the heavenly board game, Are You There, God? It's the quarterly earnings report called The Boardroom Devils of Corporate Hell. And it has some of our friends who are playing in it. Uh, that cast includes Vivid Vivka, Wes Johnson, Tobias McCurry, Fei Leung, Sam Houston, Sam Sterling, and Sheldon Robert Morley. And what we're doing is uh, we're playing the game from the Hell's point of view, and they will come across different information because Heaven has just declared Armageddon. What is Hell going to do about it? <laughs> the following week, which is on December 15th, we will be returning to the Heavenly Boardroom game uh, because they said, well, we kind of want this to be an ongoing thing, and so we are. And in this case, um, the big thing that they'll be dealing with, having interns. Where do we put them? Oh, boy. We, we wanted interns. Now what do we do with them? Because the Armageddon has just happened. And then on the 22nd, which is the week after that, I'll be running my, my game which is St. Mary's Roses Have Thorns. It's an original game that I have designed um, for Game Over Video Chat. And it's a game of backhanded compliments. So if you like throwing shade, if you like um, being the Dowager Countess, if you like RuPaul's Drag Race and you think you can deliver a backhanded compliment without directly insulting anyone except their intelligence, I am still looking for players because to do that on stream is very difficult and it's a play test. So um, we're not expecting everything to be right. I might be running this a few different times just to figure out how this game works. So you'll be seeing a live play test of that game and you're gonna see a lot more uh, different games from um, from us here on um, Live Action Weekly. Hells yeah. You might also see a few of our uh, special guests around uh, from previous episodes, and you uh, also might see um, Cynthia or I in some of them as well. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, the, and as for those games, they're one shots. They're meant to be the length of like a board game, essentially. So, if you are worried about sitting down for three hours, like most tabletop games, these are generally an hour, an hour and a half of gameplay. But then we have some discussions before and after so if you're worried about oh i don't think i have the time we at least teach you how to play some of these games as well and where to find them so if you want to run them with your friends on zoom we give you the opportunity to do that uh oh yeah uh i mean like actually you mentioned uh vivka uh like th this upcoming episode that ryan mentioned with hell uh if you are curious about seeing some of vivka's role play um she's got some fun plans in mind. Uh, I think you will not expect what she's going to be doing. Uh, I, so I, I encourage people to catch it. I did not expect what she was doing. And then she sent me a text. I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. You're going to go there. You're fully invested. Awesome. Oh boy. Is she? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Um, so again, thank you for joining us here for our episode of life action rule play. How to create a memorable character. Thank you to our guests, Mike and Spencer. Thank you, you so much awesome. for joining us, so especially since Thanks this all us. happened last minute. Yeah. Uh, thank you to our technical director, Joe. Thank you Joe's to awesome. the audience who's watching and thank you to our Patreon supporters, uh, without which we would not be able to continue making this content um, under lockdown, but you have, and it's been very, very helpful and we've so been able to improve true. equipment. So thank you for that. Um, we are going to raid our friend, uh, Seuss MD. So yeah. stick around as we raid them. They're playing Stellaris right now. Uh, Which is a Stellaris, Stellaris role-playing session as well, because all of the diplomacy that they do is in character. Boy, how do they get up to shit. Yes, and Kai has been um, on, has been a guest on that. So, yeah. uh, so we're going to raid and say hi. And, oh, yeah, we are. Uh, yeah, and uh, until next time, Bye. Bye. Bye.